Okay, you mentioned the well, we mentioned briefly the extended supplementary list. A lot of stuff was going on uh, around that point, uh, with the politics of bookmaking, buying and selling pitches, boards on rails, etc. And you were involved in the a lot of the discussions and the um, you know the the, the really, how how frustrating was it trying to get bookmakers to agree on anything? Oh, the bookmakers never agree on anything. I mean, um, it's, it, they're notorious for it. Uh, you try and get a, 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 a bunch of bookmakers together and they'll all have different views and different opinions. So that was impossible. But um, no, the, the, I mean, the uh, boards on rails, for instance, um, which transformed the rails business. I, I remember the chairman of the levy board at the time, I think it was called Sir John Sparrow. And he was asked, and it's on film somewhere, you know, when do you... Uh, when do you think boards are rails? He said, not in the foreseeable future. And that was, I think it was quoted again by Rodney Bracker, who was chairman of the levy board. It may have been Rodney Bracker who said it, but Sir John Sparrow was something to do with it. Uh, so people thought, well, that's okay, then, um, you know, we'll carry on as we are. And it, I think within six months, there were boards on rails. And, um, and then, uh, was it the uh, buying and selling came in right after that? I think it was. I think it came in before. Uh, it came in before, so all of a sudden the rails pitches were worth a lot, a lot of money. And uh, there was a few people who who bought early days, and um, they did very well out of them. Yeah. So how I, how did the buying and selling? Did, was there a mass exodus of the old school when the buying and selling came? Yeah, in? there certainly was. Uh, I mean, um, I think the first ever auction was at Sandown Park, and. I went along with Joan Redfern, who, who was the proprietor, her husband, the uh, late husband Bernard had passed away and she took over the pitches. And she never really was into it, but she, they were good pitches. And um, she went along with, Aunt, <coughs> excuse me, Anthea Redfern, who was famous for being Bruce Forsyth's uh, wife, and uh, didn't have a clue. And I, and I said, well, I'll come along with me and we'll, we'll see what it, how it all, and it was, Doncaster Bloodstock, Henry Beebe, who professionally did the auction. Anyway, um, she put in put her pictures in in a bunch lot, like there was Newbury, there was Ascot, there was Newton, there was Exeter, there was Talton, there was Wink. And she said, what do you think, what do you think I'll get, dear? And I, and, and I said, I've got no idea. That's all we can do is gauge on what the others are going for, because it wasn't one of the first ones. And I think it got up to about 125,000. I said, I think you've done all right, you know, I think. The, in future years, it would have got more, but who knows at the time. So what, what sort of people were buying in? I mean, were they established bookmakers or people that thought it was easy? There's a few that are still going now. I mean, um, just off the top of my head, I mean, West End Racing, they bought um, a lot of other pictures that I didn't want. The Southampton-based firm, and they're still going. So they were established off-course, and there was a number of off-course firms that bought in. But there was an awful lot of them came in who didn't have a clue, and um, they they soon they soon went. They just didn't um, operate for that long. And how how did it affect the sort of the way it worked? Was, was there any sort of changes? Because I remember there used to be um, a seniority list, that sort of thing. Was that did that all change? Yeah, in the that, old that, school? that originally um, there was a list made out. Um, uh, of, of uh, the number where you were, it was all done by a committee. Uh, there was a lot of problems over that with the away bookmakers. Where did they stand? Because there used to be specific away, but only on away meetings, and they didn't. They had seniority, but they oh, they, they were aggrieved by the outcome anyway. Let's put it that way. But I, I know I wasn't on that committee to do it. I mean, it, well, I was out of it, and uh, I ended up with sort of middle of the road pitches. Um, but um, there was a, there was an awful lot of problems. But the, yeah, the, originally they kept you could if you bought say number ten at Ascot, you, that would be your number. But you had no seniority. So somebody like myself, who had a, probably a lot of seniority, if there was gaps in front of that, I would move up and go in front of them, and that didn't go down well. So I think within about 12 months, they said there's no seniority involved. It's just whatever number you are and you move up. And, that, and that's the way it is to this day. OK, there's a lot of things that carried on after that that affected the betting ring. Um, one of the first ones was bookmakers using computers. Now, you were one of the pioneers of that. I mean, I think probably the second bookmaker after John Lovell to, to get one. That's correct, yeah. I mean, um, John Lovell, uh, lovely late John Lovell, smashing bloke. Um, he... Um, we sent him, the NAB, that's National Association of Bookmakers, he was on our 
he was one of our directors, we sent him off to Australia to look at how it was done over there. And he came back and said, yeah, yeah, this is the way forward. And, and um, we, uh, yeah, I was, I, I think he, he set, he set one up and um, he had his little Welsh team around him and there was a Welsh firm that started it. I can't remember what they were called, but um, we set up with a, just an ordinary keyboard, not a specialized keyboard like they are now and big car batteries. And I think the first meeting we ever went to was Bath and, uh, oh, and I was standing them for grands, monkeys at least, you know, like, uh, because it was complete haywire and I think got away with it. But in the early days, uh, the computers were just like going wrong until they, until, until you got on top of them and it was a, it was a boom and it was a bonus. And um, uh, the thing is in this business, the bookmaking on course, it's always about getting an edge. And uh, computers in the early days, you, you definitely had an edge with the people that... There was an example in the early days, one of our ex-directors on the NAB was called Mel Jones from Wales, and he, he said, there's no way that a can, computer can do bets quicker than my fastest clerk can. And they actually had a test and the computer left him miles behind you. Know? <laughs> so uh, they, they gradually got persuaded that, that was the, that was the future. Yeah, the, the punters like to see on the ticket what they could win and what they backed. Well, it's hard to believe now that you gave a ticket out uh, with three numbers on it and your, and your name and the clerk would put it in the six pound to four down to ticket 32, but no recognition of what the bet was or anything. So the punter way went with this ticket. And of course, a lot of them used to look at it, especially the younger generation. Well, what does it mean, you know? And it could, it could lead to massive problems. Um, somebody says they bet 20 quid each way and you've got it down in the, the book on a busy day at 20 quid win. Who was right? And we brought out recorders, little mini recorders to listen to the bets with all the racket going on in the race course and it hold, hold, held all your business up while you were doing it. And yeah, you were wrong. You only, you know, it was, it was a nightmare. So these computers with all your itemized stuff, it was just fantastic. So how long did you keep the edge before they'd all cottoned on? Well, I think one of the, the days I remember um, was at uh, Cheltenham and uh, uh, I had a very good pitch there at, those, in the, at the Guinness Village. And I turned up there and I looked in the gear and there was no printer. I thought, oh, God, I left it behind. I thought, what am I going to do? And, and um, one of my staff drove back to Bar, um, Taunton and I've got Susan to drive up to Taunton from Torquay to bring this this lost component. And I think one of my competitors, who was a very good friend of mine, Jack Lynn and Roy Lynn, spotted it and said, Christ, he's gone back all that way to get this. And I used to say to them, they, they used to, although they were friends, we were competitors, and he'd say, what's it like? I said, probably wouldn't suit you, Roy, probably wouldn't suit And this day, that was it then. He said, if he's gone back that far to get this, this uh, printer, that's got to be the way forward and it was now as well as uh, being a bookmaker you're also a magistrate yeah i mean i think um i think probably be because i've been on all these appeals at the national association of bookmakers i got into the sort of legal legal uh, i was quite interested in the legal side of things so um i applied I, I applied myself to become a magistrate i think they put an advert in the paper we were looking for new magistrates younger generation and I applied and uh, I had to go through tough interviews um, to do that. And uh, there was just a bit like the, NA, the, the bookmakers interviews were all around a table and they would try and suss out what sort of character you were. They would put an almost impossible question like, oh, there's a single mother with three kids who's stolen the loaf of bread and groceries, but it's the third time she's done it in a month. What would you do with her? And if anyone come out and say, oh Christ, chuck her in jail, bung away the key, she can't keep getting away with this. They didn't want to hear that. You've got to be a, like, a fair-minded person. And um, but one of the things that was a bit humorous that they said, um, well, what odds do you think you are about getting this uh, role as a magistrate? I said, uh, probably about tips on, I <laughs> think. Tips on? Yeah. So, and yeah, I did. I served for 17 years, and part of that as, as the chairman of the bench, which is the three of you, the one in the middle of the I will send you down for six months custody. Da, da, da. Did any of your uh, any of your former in, in inverted commas customers do a double take when they got to the? Funny enough, I had, a, I had a jockey came in actually, 
who uh, got a bit naughty at something, nothing to do with racing actually. And I said, and he'd just ridden the winner the day before at an accident. And I said, what are you doing? You know, and I, I said, you've just ridden the winner. The future's in front of you. You, you, keep, you keep your nose clean. And, you know, and he's still riding in the point of points today, actually. And uh, we can't um, talk to you without mentioning the fact that you were the chairman of Talker United. Yeah, well, you know, I did, you know, I sort of, uh, I nearly played for them. I, was, uh, I remember the manager coming to my door one day when I was about 17. They wanted to take me on as a trial, trialist up there and whatnot. And I broke my ankle or something the next day. So it never happened. It's all about timing. But I've always been a fan talking United, And they got into big financial difficulties and I think, 2015 and the current directors had, had enough they'd run out of their money so four of us went in and uh put some money in and uh but basically the t the club survived and um yeah i did it for a couple of years and uh it was really interesting i mean uh, i used to go all the away trips some of the some of the away trips were like barrow and hartlepool and gateshead and not nice you know coming back on a saturday night and you've lost one nil but yeah, I, I enjoyed it, and uh, it was only a temporary thing. But uh, funnily enough, <clears throat> a firm called Gaming International have taken over a club or who operate greyhound tracks at <coughs> Reading and Swindon. I think. Okay, so you, we've mentioned before that you were a pioneer <coughs> of the uh, bookmaking. We've you know started with a lot of uh, things, including the computers. Future of the betting rings looking a bit um, looking a bit dicey at the moment. <coughs> What what would be your what would be your next move as a bookmaker? Well, I've only got probably um, <coughs> excuse me, I've probably only got about five or six pictures left now, so I'm sort of semi-retired. But the future, I'd love to say it's promising, but I, I'm really concerned with it for anybody's in the business because they're talking about cashless. It seems to be the operative word. It's just not going to work with racecourse bookmakers or even the tote on the racecourse. I mean, uh, people will turn up on a racecourse if it's cashless. What's the incentive to bet with the bookmakers or the tote? Oh, they can do it on the phone. It's no difference. Uh, I think it's very, very worrying. And, and really, um, and people like cash. People like to draw their winnings and count it out. It's just part of the enjoyment of the day. The colour of the excitement. It would be very, very sad if... Um, if they, if it ever comes in, I, I'd, I'd be extremely worried about the future. So, what would what would you suggest to the to the bookmakers that are sort of looking at do a career for the next twenty years? Well, I, I mean, that's one thing that's, that's you know, cash is cash is king. It's got to stay. And uh, I, I, I mean, the NAB, we've had meetings about this, and I'm still on the director of the NAB, and and um, we cannot lose this this battle because the older generation, the, the, the big race goers, they love cash. A lot of them haven't got a a, a reader, a card, a credit card, or a debit card rather. And the bookmaker is going to have to get their act together and persuade. And it's just the tote as well. It's not only bookmakers; the tote are going to be affected by this as well. And would. Twenty years time, are there going to be racecourse bookies? Well, I won't be around, Simon. But yeah, I hope so. It's all part of the excitement and the racecourse and the colour of the ring. So we need it. We need to keep going. Brilliant. Well, Dave Phillips, thanks very much. Thoughts. You're quite welcome.